Thank you very much, Jalal. And for, thanks, uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for, the, for this great event uh, and for, for the invitation as well. So this talk will be about how to represent the solutions of uh, variational inverse problems. And uh, the philosophy is uh, a bit similar to what uh, Chandra Sekaran and co-authors uh, advocated uh, a few years ago uh, when they introduced this notion of atomic norm. Uh, when what they, they meant is that uh, when you do some uh, regularization, you tend to, to favor some, uh, some, uh, some structure in the, in, the, in the solution. And in fact, uh, they, they claim that the solutions were a combination of, uh, of a few atoms. And we will try to make this uh, statement a bit more precise and a bit more quantitative in this, um, in this talk. So this is a joint work with Claire Boyer, Antonin Chambol, Johan de Castro, Frédéric de Gournay, and Pierre Weiss. And uh, let me mention that uh, in the same time as we were doing this work, uh, we found that uh, Christian Bredis and Marcello Caioni were also working on the same topic. So they also have a, a preprint. And uh, well, let's say that uh, this talk will uh, advertise for uh, both papers. <laughs> so, um, First, I will um, explain what I mean by the uh, representer theorem. In fact, there are lots of representer theorems already in the literature. And um, I will try to elaborate a, a, general, uh, a general principle about this. And then I will explain how it's related to an old theorem, I mean, a theorem of, uh, of, the in, of the 60s by Dubin and Klee. Uh, and eventually, I will specialize it to, to uh, total variation imaging. So what do we mean by a uh, representer theorem? Well, uh, let's look at a very uh, basic uh, situation where you have um, m linear uh, measurements and uh, you want to solve an inverse problem uh, using, for instance, the basis pursuit. So you want to find the, the vector uh, x which has the least L1 norm um, and which provides the observations uh, y. And there is a, a principle, a, it's a folklore result in the literature, which tells you that there is a solution to this variational problem, which is m-sparse, when you have m measurement. So what do I mean by m-sparse? Well, simply that uh, there is this solution has at most m non-zero entries. So this is somehow uh, interesting if uh, m is small uh, with respect to, to p. And, um, let me mention that this also holds for more general uh, uh, functionals. Uh, for, for instance, if you penalize um, being a bit uh, different from uh, the observation, if you penalize the constraint uh, with the quadratic uh, L2 norm, for, for instance, um, then this also holds. And the reason is that you can simply choose a solution of P lambda and fix this value of phi x and then uh, look at this constraint minimization problem for the value of phi x that you have found. And any solution of uh, this problem here, p, will also be a solution to, to this one. So uh, this representation uh, principle is, is quite, quite general, in fact, and it's sufficient to look at this constraint problem here. And there are, in fact, many variants of this uh, principle in, in uh, linear programming and semi-definite pro programming and in the theory of uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. But we really, get in, we really got interested in, into this, uh, this phenomenon um, when working with um, basis pro the basis pursuit for measures. So let's say you have a continuous domain X, um, which is compact for technical uh, details, and uh, we have measurements which are simply um, in the integration of uh, some continuous function against our signal, which is modeled uh, as a random measure. Okay, and now what we do is that we look for the measure which produces the same observations y and which has the least total variation. Uh, here it is the total variation of measures, I mean the total variation of measures, which is in fact some generalization of the L1 norm. Uh, it's defined by uh, this, it is a dual norm of the, the set, the, the space of continuous function. And um, if mu is uh, sum of a, Dirac, of a few Dirac masses, then the total variation is simply the sum of the absolute values of the amplitudes. On, um, on the other hand, 
If you have a density uh, with respect to the Lebesgue measure, then the total variation is the L1 norm of the density. So it's really um, continuous generalization of the usual uh, L1 uh, basis pursuit uh, techniques. And um, the main interest of this model is that um, you do not impose a grid in your, in your, in your modelization. So uh, you, you remove this uh, basis mismatch mass uh, phenomenon and the grid artifacts. And this triggered a lot of interest in recent years uh, following the, the pioneering work of uh, De Castro and Gamboa and also uh, Christian Bredis and uh, Picarainen. And the, the massive uh, interest uh, came after the, the paper by Candes and Fernandez Gandela. Um, so this, model, this kind of models uh, are, are, are used in, in um, signal processing uh, problems like deconvolution, frequency estimation, or super resolution. In fact, it's uh, much older than that. And uh, it was used, for instance, in the work of uh, Krein and Ber Berling uh, for the generalized moment problem in the 1930s. So curiously, this, pro this model actually uh, provides one of the oldest representative theorem that I am aware of. Um, this result by Tsuroviki tells you that there is a solution to the, the minimization, the basis pursuit for measures, which is a sum of a few Dirac masses. And a few years later, Fischer and Jerome refined this result by stating that the extreme points of the set of solutions are of the form of a sum of a few Dirac masses. So um, what is an extreme point? In fact, an extreme point in a convex set, it's a point which cannot be expressed as a convex combination of other points in that set. Okay, so here on this, on this drawing, um, you have E0, E1, E2, E4, E3, and all the points on this uh, red arc of circle. And there's a nice property with extreme points, if you have some uh, topological uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, this property tells you that um, the, a, a convex set can be reconstructed from the extreme points by simply taking the closed convex all of those extreme points. It's the Krein-Nilman theorem. So that's good news because by Fischer and Jerome's theorem, if we know the extreme points of the set of the solutions, we can reconstruct, in fact, the full set of solutions. Let me mention that, in fact, the, 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 the work by Fischer and Jerome um, studied a, a, more, a more complex uh, problem. In fact, they, they consider the functional space, a, a differential operator L, which maps some functional space into the space of, onto the space of measures. And they also have a representer theorem for this kind of, of, of problems. So th this kind of, of result was um, <coughs> generalized uh, by uh, Michael Unzer and collaborators, and also by uh, Axel Flint and Pierre Weiss. And um, what are the consequences of this uh, representation uh, principle? Uh, well, in, for the theory, it's good to know that the total variation promotes Dirac masses. If you want to find point sources, Dirac masses, then a good regularizer is the total variation. But also, there's also good news on the side of um, numerical algorithms, is that you can solve an infinite dimensional problem on a computer. So it feels a bit awkward to say this after understook. I'm sorry, I don't mean uh, <laughs> in, in your sense, but what I mean is that, well, you can parameterize a solution by taking the amplitudes and the position. You can put that into your computer and eventually you will get a result. I'm not speaking about robustness, precision, and so on. But <coughs> it's uh, already remarkable, I think, that you have a problem in infinite dimension and you can, in fact, um, plug this into a computer and um, actually run a, an algorithm which is known to converge to, to some solution of your infinite dimensional program. And there's a nice, uh, uh, a nice algorithm by, uh, by, by Christian, uh, Christian Bredis and Picarinen, um, which uh, revives the, the Frank Wolf uh, techniques and which simply um, iteratively adds atoms, uh, extreme point, uh, sorry, direct masses, and then um, shifts them a, a bit, and which is 
very, very efficient. It's, it has a lot of uh, uh, good numerical properties. So how general is, is this phenomenon? Can we extend uh, this kind of results and this kind of numerical uh, methods to, to more general um, regularizers? In particular, can we do this for the total variation of the gradient? So in this talk, I will only look at the theoretical side. And uh, let me mention that the key point here, the key observation we, we need to make, is that in the case of the L1 norm, the extreme points of the, um, well, the one sparse vectors, the, the, the atoms that you're um, using, are in fact the extreme points of the unit ball of the L1 norm. And in the case of the um, total variation norm for measures, then it's the Dirac masses that are the extreme points of this unit ball. Okay, so we, we gave it a try. We, we took this observation and we tried to, to, we tried to write a, a theorem. So we want to be able to deal with infinite dimensional spaces. So let's, let's take a, a Banach space, for instance, a regularizer R, uh, for instance, positively homogeneous, and uh, a linear measurement. And the conclusion, I mean, this is what we, we aimed at. The conclusion is that every extreme point of the solution set is a convex combination of at most m extreme points of the level set of the regularizer. Uh, so far, so good. But if you want to make things a bit more precise, if you want to ensure that, in fact, there is a solution to your problem, if you want to ensure that there are extreme points, then maybe you might be tempted to, to add some compactness um, assumption, some coercivity on your, on, your, uh, on your function. And if you do that, then you see that you cannot use a Banach space anymore because if uh, the regularizer is the, is the, is the norm of the, of the space, then you know that the level set will not be compact. So you need to work in a, in a more, um, in a slightly more general framework, which is the, space, uh, the locally convex uh, vector spaces framework. And once you have chosen a good topology, for instance, if you work with measures, then you will not use the, 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 strong, the strong topology. You have to use the weak star topology. Once you have done that, uh, you have to check that your linear measurements uh, are uh, continuous. So, in the end, we get a theorem like that. Uh, we, were, we were happy with that theorem. But if you look at it, uh, it seems that topology is uh, critical in, in, in this phenomenon. But in fact, being an extreme point, it's a completely geometric notion. There's no need for, for topology. But we were happy uh, with that until we found out that maybe more than 50 years ago, some people had solved almost the same problem in a much more elegant way. So, to state their theorem, let me introduce a few uh, definitions. Um, you take a vector space and a convex set, and you need to define what a closed set is without introducing a topology. So how can you do that? You can simply take the intersection of your set with any line. So it gives you some interval. And you say that the set is linearly closed if the endpoints of this um, intersection belong to the set C. So here it's unbounded there, so you don't have any endpoints, so there's nothing to check. And here the point should belong to, to C. And I also need the notion of extreme ray which extends the notion of extreme point. Well, an extreme ray is a half line such that any point on it cannot be expressed as a convex combination of points which do not belong to this half line. So it looks a bit complicated, but think of it as the half lines that are faces of the convex set. Okay? So in this uh, drawing, it would be those blue lines here. And the, the, the theorem by Dubin and Klee is the following. It, it concerns the intersections of a convex set and an affine space of co-dimension co M. That is, you have M affine constraints, and uh, you want to see uh, 
um, which visible points are in, a, in this set C. Well, they have this result, this very nice result, which tells you that the extreme points of this intersection is in fact a combination uh, of at most m plus one extreme points. So that's very reminiscent of what we are trying to, to, to write. But since they also deal with the unbounded case, they have an alternative case. Um, they say that these extreme points co can, can also be a convex combination of at most m points, each in an extreme, each an extreme point, or in an extreme ray of C. So let's, let's, let's look at this. Here, uh, you see, you have your, your, your feasible set F, and it inter intersects the, um, the convex set C along this half line. And the extreme point is uh, that guy, and it's a convex combination of E0, E1, and E3. So that's three, three points. But you could also look at, a, at another configuration. <laughs> if you have uh, this feasible set, then you have two extreme points, and they are a convex combination of a point in that extreme ray and another point in this extreme ray. But you need two. Okay? So let me just mention a, a, a bit, a, a tiny detail. Uh, it's the fact that they implicitly assume that the set of extreme points is non-empty. They do not really um, prove this. That, that is why they do not make any assumption of compactness and so on. So they remove this uh, existence part, so you have to prove it by other means. But once you have done that, you know that necessarily geometry comes in and you can describe the extreme points. But in fact, the theorem proves that if you have an extreme point in the intersection, then there will be uh, some extreme point in the, in the convex set C. It's just a byproduct. And the very nice thing <coughs> with this theorem re, re, with respect to, to, to our formulation uh, is that there is no topology and it deals with the under, unbounded case. <coughs> so, so far so good. Let's use it in our, in our framework. And let's look at the case of the total variation uh, minimization for measures. So we choose F as the, our feasible set for the uh, fine constraints. C is simply the level set the, the ball uh, for, our, um, for our norm corresponding to the value of the problem. And the set of solutions is, is the intersection of those two sets. Okay, so we have this representation. What happens? We have one point too many. In our theorem, we had m points, and here you have m plus one. So what's the reason for that? Well, simply that Dobbins and he, they look at any arbitrary configuration of convex sets and defined spaces. But if you are doing some convex optimization, it's uh, very unlikely that you will be um, confronted to, to, this, to this situation. So here you have C is the level set of R, and your feasible set is simply the points, the inverse image of, of Y. Okay? Uh, that's an arbitrary configuration. But if you look at this, well, you might be tempted to think that the internal points here, they are inside, in the interior of R, of the level set. They probably have a less value of R than, than, than the level set T, than the value T. At least if you do not reach the, the minimum, if, if T is not the minimum of the convex function R. Okay? So in practice, when you do convex optimization, what happens is that you, you shrink the value, you reduce the value of t, and you shrink the level set until the set f is tangent to the convex space, to, to the convex set. Okay, and now you see that things are different. Uh, here, my extreme point was a convex combination of at most three extreme, extreme points of C, and now if I am tangent, it's different. I only need two extreme points. So we plugged this information in the proof, and we got a new theorem, exactly solving uh, our needs. And the, theory, the, the theorem is, is uh, this one. Take a convex function R, and uh, assume that there is a solution. So you can do this. Then you can use uh, topological arguments, but it's not, uh, not our business here. 
you, you assume that you have proved that there, is a, there are minimizers. And uh, you assume some uh, closeness uh, on the set of minimizers, and you assume that there is no line. So uh, I skip this, this part for, for, for simplicity. And if the value of the problem is uh, larger than the minimum value of the function, the, the regularizer, then we get what we wanted. Any extreme point of the set of solution is a convex combination of at most m extreme points of the level set of the regularizer. Or a convex combination of at most m minus 1 points, each an extreme point, or a point in an extreme ray of the level set. <coughs> but if there is equality between the value of your problem and the, the, the minimum of the regularizer, then you are in an arbitrary configuration between your feasible set and your level set. So you're back to the Dubinson key theorem. Okay, so in practical cases, if you use a norm, this is uh, uh, rarely a problem because um, usually, well, if R is a norm, then the, the, this level set will be simply zero. So you are not with m plus one, ex uh, m plus one extreme points at all. So it's very pessimistic. But it, it, it's useful if you're looking at um, feasibility problems, for instance. Okay, and what's the idea of the proof? It's in fact uh, very simple, but um, I'll just give you the, 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 the idea. Um, the first step is to show that the, the, the extreme points of uh, the solution set, they belong to a face of, of um, the level set with dimension at most m minus one. And this is the key step. And once you have done that, you are on a convex set in finite dimension. It is closed. So you can use Kara Theodore's theorem. But since it's unbounded, you'd better use uh, an extension of that theorem, which is due to, to Cli, which tells you the following. Um, if the convex set has, uh, has no, contains no line and it's closed convex, then you can express any point as a convex combination of at most d plus one extreme points of C, so that's the classical Kara Theodorist theorem, or at most d points, each an extreme point or a point in an extreme ray. So that's the same. So here, here uh, the points uh, in this uh, triangle would be expressed as a convex combination of, of three extreme points, but in this region, it would be a convex combination of two points in extreme rays. Okay, and that's, that's it. You, you, you get your, your theorem if you have uh, proved that. Okay, so now let's, let's look at uh, the examples. Well, the first one is the, uh, the, the, the one of the beginning, minimizing the, the total variation uh, of measures. You find uh, the expected result. The, the extreme points are the sum of a few at most m Dirac masses. Let's look at the feasibility problem now. Uh, you have the same linear constraints and you have this indicator function of uh, non-negative measures. You are looking for non-negative measures which produce um, some uh, fixed moments against, uh, let's say, polynomials or trigonometric polynomials. Then the extreme points of the, of the, um, the solution, provided it's not empty, again, provided it's not empty, the extreme points can be uh, written as a sum of at most m plus one um, Dirac masses. And uh, let's look now at the set of the cone of uh, positive semi-definite matrices. You want to find a positive semi-definite matrix which uh, produces some uh, uh, fine uh, measurements. And you will get, since, uh, okay, so the feasibility problem, it's, um, it's a zero or plus infinity, so in practice, if you're feasible, you reach the minimum of the regularizer. So this is why you need m plus 1 and, and not m, okay? And so here, uh, you also have m plus 1. Um, you are a sum of at most m plus 1 rank 1 matrices. But that's very pessimistic. In fact, it's useless if uh, m plus 1 is larger than, than m, so the size of the matrices, okay? And you can do much better than that. And the reason is, is the following. So let's remind that 
if a matrix has rank R, it can be written as the sum of uh, at most R rank 1 matrices. Okay? And the trick here is that Carat Theodoris theorem is too pessimistic when representing points in, in this convex set. If you have a matrix of rank R, R, it actually belongs to a face of dimension 1 half R times R plus 1. Okay, so roughly the square of the rank. It means that if you have an information on the dimension of your face, and if you remember the, sorry, if you remember the proof, uh, the proof was simply stating at first that the dimension of the face is at most M minus 1. So if you have information on this dimension, you plug here M, and you roughly found that uh, you are at most a sum of square root of your number of observations. And you, observe, or you obtain this, this quantity for the, the sum of atoms, and it is a result which is known in the, in the SDP literature. Uh, it's a result by Barvinok, as far as I know. So, well, the main message of the theorem is actually, if you look at the extreme points of your solution set, they belong to a phase of dimension at most m minus 1. And if you have some um, precise information on the, on the structure of the faces of your regularizer, then you can say a bit more than simply the sum of m atoms. Okay, so it's, it's a key, key point in, uh, in this uh, representer theory. So now let's look at total variation imaging. So the total variation of the, of the gradient, it's been used uh, many times uh, in, this, uh, in this workshop. It's simply the, the total variation of the uh, measure, uh, the gradient. It's defined by duality, uh, by, by this, uh, this formula. And it's been used for, for many years now, since the, the, the work by uh, Rodin, uh, Osher, and Fatemi. So let's say we have uh, sensing a function, uh, observation operator uh, phi defined by uh, those function uh, phi high. We simply integrate um, our function u against those function phi high. And uh, we look for the, the, the function which has the least total variation explaining those measurements. For instance, you have an ideal image, you blur it and you sample, and then you have m measurements. Well, the key to our, represent, uh, to our representation uh, theory on total variation is this result, which is due to Fleming, in fact, which, but it was formulated in, in terms of, uh, of currents, or generalized surfaces. But it was uh, revitalized by uh, Ambroso, Cassayes, Maslow, and Morel, um, and translated in, into the framework of BV functions. And they say the following, the extreme points of the total variation unit ball are the functions which are the indicator functions of simple sets divided by their per parameter. So what is a simple set? Roughly speaking, it's a simply connected set. So it's a, a set which is in one, one part and it, which has no hole in it. And um, so this was done in, uh, in RD, but if you're interested in, in the body domain case, uh, uh, there's a this was studied in the paper by, by, by Christian. And it's, uh, in a sense, it, it's the same, same result. So what's the idea of the proof? How, where does it come from? Well, um, in, this, in this phenomenon, the co-area formula it, it plays a central role. And the co-area formula, it, it tells you what? It tells you that if you want to compute the total variation of a function, Instead of um, computing the gradient and integ integrating its L1 norm, you can also slice it along all its level lines and sum their parameters. And it's very, um, very useful. And um, let's see how it works here. You, you let's assume that you have an extreme point U. You have an extreme point U and um, Let's prove that it can only have one non-trivial level set. Well, take this function, for instance. 
you can uh, threshold it and split it in, in the sum of two, two functions, u1 and u2. And uh, then you can rescale this one so that it has a unit total variation. And you do the same for, for this one. And doing this, you write u as a convex combination of this function, which has unit total variation, and this other one, which also has unit total variation. And the key point is that the total variation of u is in fact the sum of the total variation of u1 and the total variation of u2. And that's the, the, the important uh, thing. And therefore, we get a weight, theta, here, which uh, is between 0 and 1. And you, you do have a convex combination of an extreme point um, using functions which are obviously different from you because they have different level sets. So that's a contradiction. Okay? So if you are an extreme point of the total variation unit ball, you cannot have many different level sets. You must have only one level set, and therefore you are in the indicator of some function, modulo the sign, okay? and divided by the parameter so that you have a unit total variation. Okay, so um, you are the indicator of a set. So what about this set? This set has to be connected because you can do the same if you have two parts here, then the total variation of E is in fact the sum of the total variation of this function and this over, over indicator function. So you do the same. You write uh, your uh, function as a convex combination of two functions which, which are obviously different from uh, the indicator of E. And that's again a contradiction. And the key is this decomposition here. It's in fact the, the good way to, to define uh, in decomposable sets. And uh, so that's, so for the, this second, uh, second point, we have proved that they are in, in one part. Let's now prove that they have no holes, but it, it's always the, the, same, the same argument. If you have uh, an, uh, a set like that with a hole here, then you can write it at the indicator of the saturated set minus the indicator of, of the hole. And again, since you have this formula, you can define a convex combination which contradicts the extremality of the point. So this is really an elementary uh, uh, discussion, but it's, it's, uh, it has far-reaching uh, consequences, I, I, I think. And in our case, uh, it proves that the extreme point of the solution set um, to our problem are the sum of at most indicators, at most m indicators of simple sets. So this gives a, a, another explanation of the, the staircasing phenomenon because you tend to promote flat regions since you have finitely many, uh, uh, many level sets. And uh, there are also uh, many other explanations, uh, especially since the, the work by, by Mela Nikolova. And so there are other explanations to, to the, the staircasing phenomenon, but this is an, a way to, to recover this. And let's do um, a little experiment to, to emphasize this phenomenon. So here we choose uh, three functions, three measurements, phi i, which are the indicators of, uh, of disks. Okay, so this actually corresponds to, to three, three measurements. Okay. We, we, we average the function u on, on, on a disk, this one, this one, and this one. And uh, we choose some, uh, some, some value uh, y, and we run the chambol poc algorithm. And what we get is this, this kind of, of solutions. So you see uh, there are uh, three shapes. And in fact, it's not, it's not well, you could expect that it's, it's uh, the free original disk, but it's not, it's not the case. You have some, some uh, interactions here. But you do have a sum of uh, three uh, indicators of simple sets. Now, can we say more than that? As you may remember, I told you that if you know the faces of your convex set, you can say more than simply the extreme points, the sum of extreme points. So if we just look at 
being a sum of uh, extreme points, you could have configurations like that. Uh, a sum of two, two simple sets which are uh, separated. One with uh, another one case with uh, inclusion. Or a simple set which, uh, which overlap in uh, some arbitrary configuration. But this is just um, stated by looking at the extreme points. If you look at the faces, um, maybe there are cases that cannot happen because if you take extreme points, they do not necessarily um, generate a, a face, right? And this is, uh, this is in fact what happens. If you look at, uh, for instance, in this simple case, you take two, two, two shapes, two simple sets, um, there is an inclusion principle. So, um, you take the indicator of two, two sets, and if they, if they uh, generate, if they span a, a face, in fact, the, either they are nested or they are well separated in the sense that their Lebesgue, the Lebesgue measure of their intersection is empty, and then their boundaries, that their reduced boundaries, is, um, is negligible for the, the <coughs> Hausdorff uh, uh, measure. So, what this, you, you can generalize this result to, to more shapes, to, to more uh, complicated faces. And what this suggests is that the structure of the faces of the total variation um, gives you some uh, tree, tree structure. And in fact, it's, it's related to, to, to the tree of shapes, which is used, uh, for, which has been used for many years in, in, uh, um, in imaging. And the, the idea of the, the, the tree of shapes is that, well, there are specialists in the room that <laughs> I feel very awkward to, to explain this, but you, you can describe a, um, an image by its level set because it contains the geometric information. And um, instead of using all the level, uh, the level lines, you can, you, can, you can simplify it by an inclusion operation. So that was this theory of uh, um, the tree of shapes that was developed especially a uh, fast level set transformed by uh, Monas and Bichard. And it was formalized for, uh, in the continuous domain by um, Ballester and, and collaborators, uh, relying on the theory of a connected, uh, uh, connected set in the sense of measure by uh, Ambrosio, Cassius, uh, Mastro, and Morel. So to, do, to cut a long story short, uh, you, you can represent um, images by, by this tree. And um, what we have proved here is that you, in fact, wh when you're minimizing the total variation with m, m constraints, you not only have some of m um, uh, indicators of set, but you have a lot of information on, on, the, on the complexity of the tree of shapes. Uh, you, you, should know, you, sh you should have at most m plus one shapes in, in the tree of shapes uh, of an image. So this leads me to, to the conclusion uh, of this talk. So this representer uh, theorem is uh, it's very, very simple. In fact, this is a, the proof are, are very short. Um, it's very general because you can use it for any convex regularization uh, problem. And uh, it's, it's somehow, I mean, it, it can derive some um, interesting information, provided that you know the extreme points of your regularizer. And, um, well, I, we, I didn't speak a lot about it, but um, it can also make it possible to, to, to derive numerical algorithms which exploit this structure. In the case of, uh, of radon measures, it has been done using this uh, Dirac um, structure. Um, hopefully, uh, we can also uh, derive things like that in the case of, uh, of total variation minimization, but it looks very difficult. But um, that's what, um, hope, um, what I hope. And uh, oh, there are also other regularizers to understand. Um, after this work, I believe that you do not really understand, uh, you do not fully understand a regularizer if you do not understand its extreme points or even its faces. Uh, so the case of uh, TGV, I, I think uh, Christian is, is working on it. <coughs> and I will be glad to, to hear the, the news. Um, as I told you, there are two papers on this topic, uh, ours, and uh, um, the one by uh, Christian Bredis and uh, Marcello Carioni. 
and I invite you to, to read them if you're interested. Thank you very much. Okay, any question in the audience? Yes. Okay, thanks for a nice talk. <clears throat> in the title there's Atomic Norm. I see the atoms, but I don't see the norm. Ah, <laughs> so it's a reference by, um, it's a reference to this paper by uh, Chandra Sekharan. Um, no, it's not a norm. The total variation is not, is not a norm, but they, they, well, they introduced this, uh, it's a gauge. It's, so yes, basically, it's a gauge. They, 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 they you don't need symmetry. It's a gauge. Possibly homogeneous. But they call it uh, yeah, atomic it norm. It was fancy. <laughs> so it's not a norm. You're right. <laughs> Any other question? Can you tell us a little bit about the noise? The if noise. You if uh, you replace the affine constraints with, uh, let's say, onto constraints. No, I have absolutely no idea. The techniques here are, are really uh, basic. You, you, have, you don't uh, use uh, duality or things like that. No. So yeah. I, I have no stability bit. analysis uh, on, on, this, uh, on this side. Yeah. And just for the sake of curiosity, uh, so the, the uh, numerical examples that you showed, yes. you discretized everything, right? Yes, everything is discretized here. Uh, in the, um, sorry. OK. Oh, it doesn't work So you anymore. have quitting. Um, okay. this, this one? Yes, it's a basic... Everything goes discrete. Uh, okay. yeah. Any other question? So if not, let's thank uh, Vincent again. Thank you very much.